Greetings and welcome to a presentation on the clinical application of total body plethysmography airway mechanics measurements. Since we all have different pulmonary diagnostics background, it's my hope that this information will be either be new or reinforce what you already know. The slides are numbered on the bottom right. If you need to leave the presentation, you can always note where you left off and pick it up from there later on. This presentation is about 50 minutes in length, so if you haven't done so already, grab a beverage, a snack, and get comfy. I have no conflicts of interest to report. The intent of this presentation is to serve as an introduction to the practical application on how airway mechanics measurements can enhance the pulmonary evaluation of select patients. Improvements in disease detection should ultimately reduce health care costs as patients would be medically managed more effectively and efficiently. The term airway mechanics refers to airway resistance measurements and related indices, airway conductance, specific airway resistance, and specific airway conductance. These are important pulmonary diagnostic tools. Airway mechanics data can be used in conjunction with other pulmonary diagnostic procedures or as standalone information if the subject is unable to perform more traditional testing, say spirometry, in an acceptable and reproducible manner. This is a topic that I've been passionate about for numerous years. Unfortunately, there's a paucity of information on this topic. Technical descriptors are published, but very little information is available on the applications of airway mechanics measurements. Total body plethysmographic measurements have been a mainstay in some hospital-based pulmonary diagnostic laboratories for many years, since individuals with obstructive lung disease have similar appearances of their forced expiratory spirograms, airway mechanics measurements are employed to assist the clinician to differentiate the site, as well as quantify the severity of airflow limitation. On the other hand, some individuals with airways disease have essentially normal appearing spirograms. In this instance, measurements of airway mechanics enhance pulmonary diagnostic evaluation and provide the clinician with better information about the integrity of the patient's airway caliber. Because of this heightened sensitivity, airway mechanics may be incorporated as primary diagnostic measurements or as adjunctive measurements to evaluate the presence and or extent of airways disease. Nevertheless, in the past, because of perceived technical and procedural difficulties associated with measurements of airway mechanics, most testing was generally limited to research and or larger hospital-based laboratory environments. Within the last 30 plus years, design improvements combined with computerization of data collection have resulted in today's total body plethysmography systems becoming more reliable, easier to operate, and easier to maintain. However, it should be appreciated that even the most sophisticated and accurate equipment is useless unless there exists a well-informed and highly trained individual to obtain and report reliable patient data so that providers may develop the best possible medical treatment plans for his or her patients. In 1998, the ATS first published the Pulmonary Function Laboratory Management Procedure Manual with the intent of providing rationale behind as well as standardizing the methods involved with how pulmonary diagnostic testing data is derived and reported. Airway resistance measurements were addressed in this nationally accepted resource. The American Thoracic Society manual is periodically updated to reflect current practice. Additionally, the American Association for Respiratory Care recognized practice variability and the necessity to standardize body plethysmographic measurements. Therefore, in the December 1994 issue of Respiratory Care, the body plethysmography clinical practice guideline was first published in an effort to potentially reduce practice variability. This body plethysmography clinical practice guideline was subsequently updated in 2001. Despite the importance of this updated clinical practice guideline, it was soon after retired with procedure deference given to the ATS Pulmonary Function Laboratory Management Procedure Manual. My careers have provided me with rare opportunities to work closely with some of the brightest and most respected researchers, clinicians, diagnosticians, and leaders in their respective fields. I'm also grateful to have had the opportunity to work with some key professional healthcare organizations on important projects whose ultimate objectives were to improve upon the delivery of high quality care. So let's get on with the show. The objectives and areas to be discussed are listed below. Uh, some common terms, definitions, and concepts used with airways mechanics. The effect of lung volumes on airway mechanics. Potential indications and relative contraindications for airway mechanics measurements. 
Some select technical considerations when determining airway mechanics and clinical applications of airway mechanics measurements using case studies. So let's take some time to review some common terms, definitions, and concepts associated with airway mechanics measurements. So for this presentation, airway mechanics refers to airway resistance, which is abbreviated as RAW, airway conductance, GAW, specific airway resistance, S-RAW, and specific airway conductance, S-GAW. So the next two slides contains terms, definitions, and concepts used throughout this presentation. Um, I would recommend if you have the opportunity to take a screenshot of these because they will be used frequently. This is the last page showing terms, definitions, and concepts. Um, if you want to take a quick second to review this, or if you want to take a print screen, go right ahead and do it. So for these airway mechanics terms and concepts, um, I've listed out what are considered the normal adult values that were obtained from the Ward and Beauchamp study. Airway resistance raw is equal to mouth pressure minus alveolar pr pressure divided by airflow. Conductance is simply the reciprocal of resistance. Specific resistance is equal to the resistance times the volume at which the measurement was obtained. And specific inductance is the reciprocal of uh, specific resistance. Airway resistance is simply the pressure required to generate airflow. It's equal to the driving pressure, in other words, the mouth pressure minus the alveolar pressure divided by flow. There's an important thing to remember is that there's a hyperbolic relationship between lung volume and airway resistance. As lung volume increases, airway resistance decreases. This graph illustrates the relationship between airway resistance and lung volume. Airway resistance is, is displayed on the y-axis and increases going up. Lung volume is displayed on the x-axis and increases going from left to right. As can be seen, there's a hyperbolic relationship between airway resistance and lung volume. As lung volume increases, airway resistance decreases. Conversely, as lung volume decreases, airway resistance increases. When we're talking about airway conductance, GAW, it's simply the reciprocal of resistance. There's a direct, almost linear relationship between lung volume and GAW. As lung volume increases, airway conductance increases. This graph illustrates the relationship between airway resistance and its reciprocal airway conductance. As stated before, there's a direct, almost linear relationship between lung volume and airway conductance. As lung volume increases, airway conductance increases. Specific airway resistance is simply the lung volume at which airway resistance was measured. Specific airway conductance, S-GAW, is the lung volume at which GAW was measured. Specific airway conductance is considered a measure of intrinsic airway resistance, which is volume independent. This graph illustrates that specific airway conductance remains basically unchanged no matter what lung volume is chosen. Keep this figure in mind as we go through the presentation as it clearly shows the relationship between resistance, conductance, and specific airway conductance. As I go through the presentation, having a clear understanding of each, what each of these terms represents is important. However, what I'm going to be focusing on is raw, S-GAW, a little bit of GAW, and I'm probably not going to mention S-RAW at all. Poisset's law mathematically addresses the relationship between resistance and flow by focusing on the following factors. Pressure differences, the internal radius of a particular tube, the length of a particular tube, and the vis viscosity of a gas flowing through a specific tube. In this case, the tube represents airways. So the take-home messages are, reduce the radius of a tube by one-fourth and the resistance increases 16 times. Also, as can be appreciated, very small changes in airway caliber may have profound effects on airway resistance. 
Let me try and break down Posse's law even further with this example and applying it directly to the topic of this presentation. Remember, if you reduce the radius of a tube by one-fourth, the resistance increases 16 times. Applying that concept to the ease of breathing through a tube, say, four inches in length, with a diameter shown in A, how much resistance would, have, would it have compared to the four-inch tube marked as B? Well, here's your hint with the explanation. Reduce the radius of a tube by one-fourth, and the resistance increases 16-fold. Hopefully, this exaggerated example helped to illustrate how the smaller internal diameter of a tube affects the resistance to the flow of a particular gas. Let's move on to potential indications and relative contraindications for airway mechanics measurements. Chapter 9, Airway Resistance and Related Indices Measured by Body Plethysmography is located in the ATS, the American Thoracic Society Pulmonary Function Laboratory Management Procedure Manual. The third edition is from 2021. And if you're administering any type of pulmonary diagnostic procedure and you do not have a copy of this manual handy, then I need to ask why. The ATS Pulmonary Function Laboratory Management Procedure Manual is a source of evidence-based indications and limitations and other extremely helpful information for the more co commonly performed pulmonary diagnostic procedures. As an FYI, the first version was released in early 1998. Some of the potential indications for airway mechanics measurements include further evaluation of airflow limitation beyond spirometry, determining the response to a bronchodilator, determination of bronchial hyperreactivity in response to methacholine, mannitol, or isocapnic hyperventilation, differentiating types of obstructive lung diseases having similar spirometric configurations, distinguishing respiratory muscle weakness from obstruction as the cause of low flow rates, and following the course of disease in response to treatment. Before the American Thoracic Society Pulmonary Function Laboratory Management Procedure Manual came out in early 1998, the American Association for Respiratory Care had developed clinical practice guidelines for specific cardiopulmonary diagnostic procedures. This 2001 is an update from the original AARC clinical practice guideline body plethysmography that was published in 1994. The American Association for Respiratory Care Cardiopulmonary Diagnostic Clinical Practice Guidelines were retired around 2002 and relinquished to the ATS Pulmonary Function Laboratory Management and Procedure Manual. So some additional considerations for the clinical applications of airway mechanics measurements include to detect airways disease earlier than is possible by spirometry. Spirometry is an insensitive tool to assess airway dysfunction. If properly performed spirometry results are abnormal, then the subject has apparent lung dysfunction. However, with spirometry, the absence of airflow limitation does not necessarily mean that lung dysfunction is not present. To differentiate airways disease from other causes of obstruction, we'll talk about this a little bit later on. To provide an effort-independent measure of airway status. Now, effort independent, the entire process from test instructions and demonstration to final measurements commonly takes place in less than five minutes. Thus, compared to, say, forced expiratory spirometry, airway mechanics measurements are rapid, easy for the subjects to perform, and require a minimum of subject participation in the testing process. Some additional areas to consider include it being airway mechanics being more sensitive in diagnosis of airways disease, Earlier detection of airways disease, airway mechanics are maybe more accurate in evaluation of airway reactivity, for, for example, with the bronchodilatation and bronchoprovocation. They may provide a differential diagnosis of obstructive disease, central versus peripheral obstruction, and they provide an enhanced evaluation of upper airway lesions. The following relative contraindications for airway mechanics measurements were derived from Chapter 9 procedure airway mechanics and related indices measured by body plethysmography from the ATS Pulmonary Function Laboratory Management and Procedure Manual, 3rd edition. Obviously, mental confusion, muscular incoordination, body casts, or other conditions that prevent the patient from entering the plethysmograph, or if they can't perform the required maneuvers, such as panning against a closed shutter, claustrophobia, the presence of devices that cause changes in uh, pressure with inside the closed cabinet, continuous O2 therapy that can't be temporarily discontinued, or the inability to pant in a smooth, coordinated fashion.
Going on to the next section, we're going to look at some select considerations when determining airway mechanics. The first area to consider is selection of predicted reference equations. First of all, the characteristics of the healthy reference population should ideally match the subjects or the clients being evaluated in your laboratory setting. Secondly, the equipment, techniques, and measurement conditions should be similar. In other words, you should measure the open shutter lo loop in the same manner as the reference authors did. Number three, following selection of appropriate reference values, compare the measurements obtained from a sample of healthy individuals that you can select, for example, 10 or 20 of them, over the appropriate age range to the predicted values obtained from the selected reference values. The next series of slides will be looking at open shutter loop morphology. Then the next two slides are simply to orient you on how inspiratory and expiratory flows are displayed during this particular presentation. You'll notice that the flow lines are limited to zero and plus and minus 0 0.5 liters per second. We'll first look at how inspiration is displayed. Just after exhalation and prior to inspiration, there's a period of no flow. When inspiration begins, the flow is deflected downward and slightly to the left. Note the negative flow depiction. Now, let's take a look at expiration. Just prior to exhalation, there's no flow. From the start of exhalation, during exhalation, and just prior to the beginning of inspiration, again, no flow, the flow is represented as being deflected upwards and slightly to the right. Note the positive flow depiction. Now, your system may display inspiratory and expiratory flows in a different manner. It doesn't matter. I just want to be certain that you understand how flows will be graphically represented throughout this presentation. It's during the open shutter panning mode when airway resistance measurements are made by plotting changes in pressure divided by flow and calculating the resultant tangent. The slope of this tangent is measured through the zero flow point of the open shutter loop with points at plus and minus 0 0.5 liters per second, which define the ends of the tangent. In order to stand, standardize the procedure, the open shutter tangent should be measured between plus and minus 0 0.5 liters per second. The total body plethysmograph resistance measurement is then corrected for the volume at which resistance was measured by measuring the closed shutter tangent as the changes in mouth pressure are plotted against changes in volume, or box pressure. Note, since there is no airflow during the closed shutter maneuver, mouth pressure approximates alveolar pressure. Panting, or similar term, is commonly used to assist the subject in understanding that very small volumes of air need to be moved during the airway mechanics maneuver. Even when compared to tidal breathing, the subject is only required to move around 50 milliliters per breath at a rate of around 90 breaths per minute. A good visual aid during the subject test instructions is for the operator to demonstrate tidal breathing air movement by holding their hands shoulder width. Then, the operator can, can place his or her first two digits horizontally in front of their lips to show the client how small the amount of air is required per pant. Panting at FRC is not required or recommended. Instead, the subject is allowed to choose the lung volume at which they feel most comfortable to perform the maneuver. The panting volume chosen by the subject is generally close to FRC, but may be slightly above or below FRC. Remember, specific resistance and specific conductance take lung volume into account. For example, Subjects with central or peripheral airways dysfunction may choose to pant at a volume slightly higher than FRC to reduce the work of breathing associated with, associated with the panting maneuver. It's easier to perform. Conversely, morbidly obese individuals may choose to pant slightly lower than FRC as it, this is easier for them to perform the maneuver. Hopefully, this illustrates why the VTG, the V-pant, obtained during airway mechanics measurements should not be used to determine static lung volumes. They're similar, yet separate measurements. Subjects with either a high end expiratory, a high end inspiratory, or both pressures will have distinctive loops, also known as tails. As can be seen, depending upon where the open shutter tangent is aligned, there may be different values of airway resistance determined. 
Unless there is a reason to include these tails into the open shutter loop tangent measurement, they may significantly alter the computer generated line of best fit results. However, there may be certain instances when both open shutter measurements may be used to report airway resistance measurements. Doing so might provide the referring healthcare provider with a better understanding of how an abnormal airway resistance may be contributing to the client's chief complaint or diagnosis. The operator should have the ability to override the computer generated line of best fit to assure appropriate measuring and reporting of airway mechanics measurements. Also, it's incumbent upon the user to have a good understanding of how the reference authors determine the open shutter tangent measurement when capturing reference data for airway resistance. Let's take a moment now to look at some of the technical considerations with regards to the, the advantages of the panting maneuver. First of all, it maximizes and stabilizes the glottic aperture. The glottis has different shapes and cross-sectional areas at different moments during the respiratory cycle, and it also depends on the average inspiratory flow. Therefore, the panting maneuver stabilizes the glottic aperture. Secondly, it minimizes exceptions to Boyle's Law. As previously stated, Boyle's Law says that in a closed system with no net transfer of gas, pressure, P, and volume, V, are inversely related if temperature remains constant. In other words, P1, V1 equals P2, V2. It also minimizes the noise to signal ratio, the effective respiratory exchange ratio not being equal to 1.0, the effect of gradual thermal shifts, and effect of small system leaks. Let's take a look at some of the open shutter panting versus tidal breathing considerations. Breathing close to 90 to 150 breaths per minute, which is 1.5 to 2.5 hertz, generally allows for, the, for a tight open shutter loop and meets the technical considerations previously described for the panning maneuver. If the total body plethysmograph has been designed to do so, tidal breathing open shutter loops may be performed with that limitation being recognized. For standardization purposes, compared to baseline, assure that the exact tangent alignment is performed with acute inhalation testing and or serial measurements. While not meeting the technical considerations previously described for the panting maneuver, the tidal breathing tangent de determination can be performed if the instrument is capable of doing so. However, despite being measured between plus and minus 0.5 liters per second, the tidal breathing tangent alignment can be assessed in a number of ways, which may affect the accuracy and meaningfulness of the reported values. Okay, let's take a look at some open shutter loop morphology, in other words, the shape of the curve. Granted, this example is a drawing and not an actual tracing, but in essence, this is what you're aiming for. Flow that is at least plus or minus 0.5 liters per second and a nice, tight, open shutter loop. Compared to the previous normal looking loop, this one is too small. You'll notice that the open shutter loop does not meet the plus or minus 0.5 liters per second threshold as previously described. In most instances, this minor error can be easily be rectified by having the client pant at a slightly larger volume. Artifact comes in many shapes and sizes. Data may be generated from these tracings, but it's anyone's guess as to what it reflects. It's incumbent upon the operator to be able to discern what graphic is usable and what is not usable. Hint, neither A nor B is usable as an open shutter loop. For figure A, despite the lines being within the plus and minus 0.5 liters per second range and a tangent can be aligned, the graphic has no meaning. Figure B, like A, these open shutter lines have no meaning either. However, some computerized systems may make it attempt to provide a line of best fit with worthless information. Sometimes clients are overzealous when instructed to perform unfamiliar breathing maneuvers. This is where clear instructions and good coaching come into play to optimize subject performance and maximize the client experience. This pant is too slow and it's close to being tidal breathing. If able, the subject should be instructed to simply pick up the pace so that the open shutter loop becomes more closed and meets the technical considerations previously described. 
This figure eight open shutter loop is commonly observed if the subject is panning too rapidly, say upwards of three hertz. The subject should be able to rectify this by simply slowing down the pan frequency to about 1.5 to 2.5 hertz. The next three graphics illustrate acceptable maneuvers. However, much like flow volume loop graphics to the trained eye, Airway mechanics graphics oftentimes offer insight into a specific airway abnormality. Of course, the traditionally measured airway resistance would be reported. However, at times, the expiratory resistance is reported separately and indicated as such to highlight the contribution a high-end expiratory resistance may contribute to the client's clinical presentation and or diagnosis. Inclusion of an example of an open shutter graphic may be helpful as well. Also, at times, the expiratory and inspiratory resistances may be reported separately and indicated as such to highlight the impact the end expiratory and inspiratory resistances may contribute to the client's clinical presentation and or diagnosis. Inclusion of an example of an open shutter graphic may be helpful as well. Of course, the traditionally measured airway resistance would also be reported. This configuration looks similar to slow panting. However, despite increasing the breathing frequency, the open shutter loop will not close. If the laboratory has the capacity to assess static lung volumes via gas dilution or washout, then it might be beneficial to do so and compare the values to static lung volumes obtained plethysmographically. The intent would be to quantify the amount of unventilated lung. Since airway resistance is a function of lung volume, measuring the absolute lung volume at which the resistance procedure was performed enables the practitioner to adjust airway resistance to this lung volume and evaluate the site of airflow limitation. For example, some individuals with peripheral airways disease during testing will increase their lung volume to decrease airway resistance. It's easier for them to tolerate, it's less work. However, by doing so, the lung volume at which the resistance is measured is increased, resulting in an increased specific resistance, which is equal to a decreased specific conductance. Conversely, if the site of obstruction resides in the central airways, these individuals will not be able to substantially reduce their res airway resistance by increasing their lung volumes, since the central airways are less compliant per unit volume of change than are the peripheral airways. Therefore, airway resistance will remain increased. Moving on to evaluation of airway disease. First of all, airway mechanics are more sensitive to airway narrowing, for example, bronchoconstriction, than are forced expiratory flows. Consider this a significant fall in specific inductance, about 35 to 40 percent, with marginal fall in flows, 10 to 20 percent, and FEV1 may suggest the presence of mild asthma. Unlike forced expiratory spirometry, minimal patient participation is required during airway mechanics. Airway mechanics measurements provide information about the structural integrity of the airways that is not evident with forced expiratory spirometry. Admittedly, though, both tests examine flow properties of the lung. Airway mechanics are generally more sensitive to alterations in flow earlier that can be seen with forced expirations. For example, a subject's peak expiratory flow may still be maintained within the normal range even if the functional diameter of the airways is decreased by 50% as long as he or she still has adequate lung volume, respiratory muscle strength, pulmonary elastic recoil, and effort when performing the peak expiratory flow measurement. This decrease in airway caliber while not always evident with forced expiratory spirometry, will be detected and evidenced as an increased resistance of the airways. Additionally, there is evidence which suggests that the peripheral, peripheral airways contribute much more than 20% of the total airway resistance, possibly the majority of airway re resistance. Therefore, airway resistance measurements, specific airway conductance in particular, may detect early, mild, peripheral airways disease. Secondly, if used alone, airway mechanics eliminate the bronchoactive effect of lung inflations. The key feature about specific airway conductance that differentiates it from FEV1 
is that it does not require a deep inhalation that's part of the spirometry maneuver to measure FEV1. Data suggests that a deep inhalation can have variable effects on airway caliber, especially in asthmatic patients, with mild asthmatics or those acutely bronchoconstricted demonstrating a transient bronchodilatation following a deep breath, and more severe asthmatics often demonstrating a bronchoconstriction following a deep breath. That being said, if FEV1 is used to assess airway caliber following a bronchoconstricting stimulus like methacholine or exercise, then the deep breath associated with measuring FEV1 may reduce SGAW and result in the FEV1 underestimating the effect of, on the airway. Because of this effect, SGAW may be a more sensitive and accurate reflection of the intrinsic, intrinsic airway resistance during such a challenge. And thirdly, if used in conjunction with spirometry, airway mechanics provide a basis for a more specific characterization of the disease. For example, a significant fall in SGAW, about 35-40%, to 40%, with no fall in flows, may suggest the presence of rhinitis or sinusitis. Now let's move into the, some clinical applications of airway mechanics measurements. Here we're going to take a look at airway size and airway mechanics in health and disease. Uh, the image on the left is a model of the human lungs, and on the right is airway generations and approximate dimensions in the human lung. As can readily be seen from these images, as compared to the larger airways, the smaller airways constitute the majority of lung connectivity and therefore surface area. Take a look at the right image and check out the total cross-sectional area listing on the far right column and compare the surface area of, say, the trachea versus the respiratory bronchioles. In the literature, there is controversy regarding how much peripheral airways contribute to airway resistance in the normal lung. However, data is consistent that the smaller airways do constitute the vast majority of airway resistance in asthma, be it mild to, se to severe, and in chronic bronchitis. Listed below are the primary causes of airflow obstruction, which can be readily observed during forced expiratory maneuvers. You'll notice that I've intentionally left out foreign bodies. They obviously cause varying degrees of airflow obstruction. As stated at the beginning of this presentation, airway mechanics measurements do assist with assessing the site of obstruction. When looking at airway resistance in airways disease, for example, asthma and chronic bronchitis, and comparing that to parenchymal mode disease, for example, with emphysema. With emphysema, you have decreased driving pressure, you have decreased flow, therefore you have a normal airway resistance. However, with airways disease, we, where you have an increased driving pressure, a decreased flow, you have an increased airway resistance. Different causes of lung dysfunction result in different patterns in airway resistance and specific airway conductance. With obstruction, caused by a decreased driving pressure, whether it's elastic or muscular in nature, or dynamic airway compression, you have a normal airway resistance and normal specific inductance. With peripheral airways disease, the airway resistance is normal, however, the specific inductance is reduced. With central airways disease, you have both an increased airway resistance and a decreased specific inductance, and with, if it's due solely to decreased lung volume, you have an increased airway resistance, and a normal specific inductance. Okay, I just reviewed a lot of information and I thank you for sticking with me. Now, let's get into the meat of this presentation and review some actual subject case studies and how airway mechanics measurements can be clinically applied. The following case studies are from my teaching files that I collected while at the University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics Pulmonary Diagnostic Services. No subjects are directly identified during this segment of the presentation. Also, this is data-only information. All beta agonist medications were administered via MDI with a spacer, and methacholine chloride was administered using a breath-actuated dosimeter. Just want to give you a quick heads up before we move on in the case studies that all the formatting of each of the studies is similar. The first one here is we looked at an acute beta agonist response in an individual with a normal specific inductance. The reason being is that the normal airway mechanics response to an acute elation of a beta agonist has not been well defined in the literature. What we saw that there 
is that there was a 15% improvement in specific inductance after administration of three inhalations of isoproteranol, which is strong beta-2, in this subject. The baseline specific inductance went from 0.46 to after drug to 0.53. It's also important to note on this slide that the V pant and panting frequency were almost identical. As a reminder, these University of Wisconsin hospitals and clinics pulmonary diagnostic services spirometry criteria were enacted prior to the current recommendations and standards. However, for some of the following case studies, these criteria provided a basis for the rationale regarding the limitation of simply relying upon spirometric data to assess the acute response to a beta-2 agonist. For our next case study, we're going to start out with spirometry values. This subject was referred to baseline testing as he perceived breathing difficulty, especially while at work. He had been working as a baker for the last six months and symptoms appeared soon after his employment. And he stated that while available, he chooses not to wear a respirator. His past medical history was negative and there was no family history of asthma. Until recently, he was a long distance runner, but decided to reduce, reduce this activity as his exercise tolerance was worsening. When compared to his reference values for someone of his age, gender, and height, the baseline spirometry values show above normal FVC, FEV1, and peak expiratory flow, which may be related to his exercise and training history. While still within the normal range, the percent predicted FEF 2575 may be considered disproportionately lower than the percent predicted FVC. The percent predicted FEF 2575 percent divided by percent predicted FVC is less than 80 percent. However, the 1991 ATS interpretation recommendations state that well-trained athletes may have a reduced FEV1 to FVC ratio as well as reduced mid-flows primarily because of the training effects on thoracic musculature. Continuing with this subject, baseline airway mechanics measurements fall within the normal range, although the ESCA is on the low end of the normal adult range. Again, when compared to his increased spirometry values, this ESCA may also be disproportionately reduced. An acute response to bronchodilator, albuterol, was elected to be performed during this visit to see if his mid-flows in ESCA might improve. As was seen, there was no significant bronchodilator response in spirometry values. However, ESCA dramatically improved. For example, more than 45 to 55 percent change post-intervention compared to baseline. This again illustrates the limitation of simply using spirometry to assess the potential effects of beta agonist response in the clinical setting. Further testing, on another day, our case study subject exhibited a positive spirometric and airway mechanics response to a low dose one inhalation of 5 mg per milliliter of methacholine chloride confirming the su suspicion of reactive airways disease. Our next case study starts out with spirometry, and this subject had previously been diagnosed with asthma and had not been adherent to her prescribed controller medications as she felt fine. However, she did use her albuterol rescue inhaler prior to jogging, which was generally around 5 miles 3 to 4 times per week and no controller or rescue medications were used for three days prior to baseline testing. Baseline spirometry suggests significant airflow limitation with a demonstrable response after acute beta agonist administration. But despite this nice post-drug response, airflow limitation was still evident by a reduced FEV1%, FEF2575%, and project and percent predicted FEF 2575% divided by percent predicted FVC ratio being less than 0.8. The subject requested that instead of isoprel, albuterol be used as she had experienced heart palpitation in the past after inhaling isoprel. Measurement of airway mechanics propose a much clearer picture of the total response to acute inhalation of a beta agonist as all of these parameters return to within the normal range. As a reminder, the low normal limit for ESCA is 0.19, based upon warden Beauchamp data. The other parameter to note is the dramatic reduction of the V-pant, which may suggest air trapping during baseline measurements. Note that the, despite a reduced FVC, FEV1, and significantly reduced FEF2575, this subject was still able to maintain a normal peak expiratory flow. 
In my opinion, this example exemplifies the limitation of using peak expiratory flow as a standalone measurement. Even after the administration of a strong beta-2 agonist, there was no significant improvement in respirometric data. Given that the subject was taking a non-cardioselective beta blocker, a tenolol, the isoprel effects on her spirometry response may have been negated. However, airway mechanics measurements show another picture, not evident with spirometry alone. Here, unlike her spirometry values, her airway mechanics measurements were close to normal at baseline and completely normalized after an acute inhalation of isoprel. This additional airway mechanics information provides a clearer understanding on how this individual may benefit from a tailored therapeutic approach to her medical management. This case study also highlights the importance of including airway mechanics measurements when assessing the acute response to an inhaled agent. Pre and post beta agonist spirometry studies alone would have completely missed out on the positive effects observed with these airway mechanics studies. Moving on to our next case study, this was a 60-year-old male undergoing a bronchial provocation study uh, with methacholine chloride. And you'll notice as you look through this data, for this study, VTG is not VPANT. Uh, at the University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics Pulmonary Diagnostic Services, time permitting, tidal breathing volume of thoracic gas was often assessed as part of the bronchial provocation protocol. Now, this subject was evaluated for the possibility of having reactive airways disease, as he noted occasional wheezing, particularly after exercise. An exercise-induced bronchospasm study was negative. However, after he was administered a total of 150 cumulative units of methacholine chloride, he exhibited a positive response, particularly in plethysmographic measurements, looking at the volume of thoracic gas and in the next slide, the uh, specific inductance. These changes are indicative of nonspecific airway hyperreactivity. Plethysmography measurements proved to be much more sensitive than spirometry when evaluating this subject's response to an inhalation challenge. Remember, his VTG increased 47%. Simply measuring his spirometric response would not have been effective enough to quantify the extent of bronchoconstriction that occurred during this test. The FEV1 did not decline by at least 20%, which is the indicator most clinicians use to evaluate hype, airway hyperreactivity. Also, after inhalation of the methacholine, despite the significant elevation in VTG, again, it increased by 47%, and a reduction in specific inductance compared to baseline, this subject had absolutely no sensation of any of these changes of his lung volume and or function. Now, remember, at the time of this study, the ATS recommended significant pulmonary function changes during bronchial provocation testing as a uh, percent change from baseline, FVC, minus 10%, FEV1 minus 20%, peak expiratory flow, and FEF2575 declines of 25%, an increase of the VTG by 25%, and a specific inductance reduction by at least 45%. Some authors, again, suggest that change between 50 to 55% may be more uh, significant than just simply having a cutoff of negative 45%. This subject was referred to the laboratory to assess reversibility of documented airflow limitation, which was based upon screening spirometry. She presented with spirometric evidence of airflow limitation as evidenced by a reduction in her FEV1 to FEC ratio, combined with a reduction in FEF 25-75%. Note, however, that her peak expiratory flow fell within the normal range, and unlike the FVC, FEV1, and FEF 25-75, did not exhibit a positive response to an acute inhalation of a bronchodilator, in this case, isoproteranol. At the time of this testing, the ATS defined a positive response to a beta agonist as greater than 12% and a 0.2 liter improvement in either the FEV1 or FVC. We might also consider a positive beta agonist flow response as an improvement of at least 25% in either the peak expiratory flow and or the FEF2575. Despite significant post-drug improvements in FVC and FEV1, as well as the FEF 25-75%, the subject's spirometry values did not normalize. With the same subject, note that the post-isoprel airway mechanics measurements improved significantly. Raw normalized, and ESCA approached a lower normal value. 
The question then arises, why did the subject's airway mechanics measurements more closely approach the normal range and her spirometric values, while admittedly are significantly improved, did not? During measurements air, airway resistance, the maximal compressible effects occurring during forced excretory maneuvers are obviated. Some beta agonists, isoproterenol in particular, cause transient decreases in bronchial myogenic tone, which results in airways becoming more compliant and compressible. Airways temporarily lose the structural rigidity exhibited during bronchospasm as the bronchial smooth muscle relaxes. Therefore, in this example, while the forced expiratory volumes and flows improved, they did not normalize, as we have seen with her measurements of airway mechanics. Remember, airway mechanics require minimal movement of air and intrathoracic pressure during the measurement process. This next case study is a female of 44 years of age, status postum of thorax, with a diagnosis of qu uh, questioning whether or not she has obstructive lung disease. Other studies show that she did have a normal diffusing capacity. Baseline spirometry shows evidence of airflow limitation. However, this case study also illustrates the limitation of relying solely on spirometric data when assessing the acute response to a bronchodilator. Other than some improvement in FEF25, 75 percent, the other spirometry parameters did not change much from baseline. Again, with this subject, her airway mechanics data significantly improved post-drug, in particular her specific inductance. This would not have been appreciated if only spirometry was used to assess a response to acute inhalation of a beta agonist. This additional information would be helpful to appropriately manage her pulmonary dysfunction. Ideally, after a pre-specified amount of time, Follow-up pulmonary diagnostic testing would be performed after the subject was adherent to a therapeutic regimen designed to optimize her pulmonary status. This 42-year-old female was unable to perform FVC maneuvers in an acceptable and reproducible fashion. Her efforts were generally submaximal as well as being variable and discontinuous. Since airway mechanics measurements require minimal patient effort, these tests were chosen to assess the presence of airflow limitation in the subject. Baseline values indicated an elevated airway resistance with profoundly decreased specific inductance. post isoprel values demonstrate near normalization of airway resistance with an improvement in specific inductance. The improvement in specific conductance indicates the improvement in airway resistance was not due entirely to an increase in lung volumes during the measurement process. This trend towards an acute improvement in post-airway mechanics substantiates the need for appropriate pharmacologic intervention and management with this subject in order to optimize her pulmonary function. A subsequent follow-up after a two-week trial of beta agonist and inhaled uh, corticosteroids showed further improvement in her airway mechanics. Her specific inductance improved to 0.19, which confirms the efficacy of her medical and pharmacologic management. This case underscores the utility of this test to evaluate patients having limited ability to perform spirometry. This subject was referred to the University of Wisconsin Hospitals and Clinics for further evaluation and medical optimization of his asthma, obstructive sleep apnea, as well as hypercarbia and room air hypoxemia. Forced expiratory maneuvers were attempted without success as the subject had difficulty coordinating his efforts and providing acceptable and reproducible maneuvers. While not shown, baseline airway mechanics measurements revealed a high end expiratory resistance. Please note the subject was unable to increase his panting frequency to the optimal 1.5 Hz despite repeated attempts to do so. After an acute inhalation of a beta agonist, the airway resistance improved, as did the specific inductance. In addition, he was able to pant in the desired range. There was also a vast improvement in the high end expiratory resistance that was evident during baseline measurements. The open shutter loops returned to a more normal appearance. The improvement in airway resistance was not due to any significant changes in the panting volume. This example further exemplifies the necessity to evaluate not only the data derived from airway mechanics measurements, but to also inspect the shape, the morphology of the open and closed shutter loops as well. To the informed practitioner, airway mechanics graphics provide as much information as do flow volume loops. Since this patient was unable to perform traditional pulmonary diagnostic testing in an acceptable fashion, airway mechanics measurements provided meaningful information to this patient's physician about the status of his pulmonary function, 
so that the physician could tailor and maximize treatment regimens. This 39-year-old female was referred to the Pulmonary Diagnostic Services for assessment of reactive airways disease. She was unable to perform spirometry in an acceptable and or reproducible manner. However, she was able to perform volumethoracic gas and airway mechanics maneuvers appropriately. After baseline data was obtained, airway challenge testing began with methacholine chloride administered via dosimeter. The placebo normal saline data, which is not shown, showed no significant change from baseline. While not considered a positive response to a low dose of an inhaled challenge agent, there was a demonstrable response as evidenced by a decline in her s -gaw. Note the increase in airway resistance, the increase in volume of thoracic gas, and the V-pant. Remember, an increase in lung volume should reduce airway resistance. During the next step of her airway challenge using methacholine chloride via dosimeter, we saw a significant increase in her volume of thoracic gas, increase in her airway resistance, and a significant decrease in her specific inductance. Note the difference between the VTG and the V-pant. Remember, in the presence of airflow limitation, it's often easier to pant at a higher volume during airway mechanics measurements. Finishing up on this 39-year-old female who was referred to rule out reactive airways disease, the post-beta-2 agonist data was included to illustrate how this subject returned to baseline after a nonspecific airway challenge with methacholine. Such a response should not be used to solely assess bronchodilator responsiveness. This 35-year-old female was referred to the Pulmonary Diagnostic Services for evaluation of her periodic dyspnea. Her baseline spirometry was essentially normal. However, she did meet the laboratory criteria for acute assessment of a beta agonist. The percent predicted FEF2575 divided by the percent predicted FBC was less than 0.8. Note the increase in mid-flow after three inhalations of venolin, despite no apparent improvement in FBC, FEV1, or peak expiratory flow. Airway mechanics, however, portray a different picture. While somewhat abnormal at baseline, the reduced specific inductance suggests peripheral airway dysfunction. There's a nice normalization after the beta agonist. Remember, in a subject with normal specific inductance, we have observed a minimal specific inductance response after administration of a strong beta agonist, isoprel. The specific inductance only improved 15%. This case study again illustrates the sensitivity of airway mechanics measurements to fully elucidate the underlying source of pulmonary dysfunction. In summary for our case studies, these case studies illustrate the utility of incorporating total body plethysmographic airway mechanics to enhance the management of patients being evaluated for pulmonary dysfunction. Airway mechanics measurements are useful tools to evaluate the presence and to quantify the extent of airway dysfunction. They can be incorporated as primary or adjunctive methods to more traditional pulmonary diagnostic procedures and provide the practitioner with better means to optimize, maximize, and individualize medical treatment strategies. Improved treatment tactics combined with early diagnosis will benefit our patients and potentially reduce health care costs. In summary then, airway mechanics measurements are important pulmonary diagnostic tools. The derived data can be used in conjunction with other pulmonary diagnostic procedures or as standalone information if the subject is unable to perform more traditional testing, say spirometry, in an acceptable and reproducible manner. Airway mechanics measurements provide a more complete picture about the integrity of a client's airway caliber, which may not be evident with spirometry alone, allowing a more tailored approach to patient management. To the well-trained technologist or provider, the shape of the open shutter loop may provide as much information as does a flow volume loop graphic. So the next three pages have references associated with them. These are the ones that were used to support much of the information contained within this presentation. I'll just pause here if you want to take a quick look at them and or take a screenshot. And this next slide, as it states, uh, provides additional references. 
And I'll just pause here if you want to do a quick review of these as well as take a quick screenshot. And guess what? We have some more references. Again, I'll pause for you to look over these as well as take a screenshot. Also, you could always come back and take a look. Okay, that's it. Thanks so much for taking time out of your busy schedule today. Hopefully, there were some new insights or some information that supported what you already knew. Either way, please share your thoughts. My contact information can be found on the Pulmonary Diagnostic Laboratory Resource Center located at www.pftlabresources.com. Also, while on my website, check out the other focus areas by double-clicking on the Resources tab. Thanks so much. Take care.